Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich freue mich sehr, dass Pierre Rossevalon heute unser Gast in den Mosse Lectures ist und ich möchte mich auf ein paar wenige Vorbemerkungen hier beschränken. Bereits vor drei Semestern, Sie erinnern sich vielleicht oder einige unter Ihnen erinnern sich vielleicht, hatten sich die Mosse Lectures dem Thema Populismus und Politik gewidmet und dabei den Versuch unternommen, die Sache des Populismus mit dramatischen Verwerfungen in gegenwärtigen Machtgefügen, mit der Erosion demokratischer Selbstverständlichkeiten sowie mit dem Auswurf verschärfter Feindschaftserklärungen und Ressentiments zu verknüpfen. Dabei hatte sich der Begriff des Populismus als ebenso unscharf wie unvermeidlich erwiesen, als eine umherschweifende Chiffre, die die politische Einbildungskraft in einen kleinen Aufruhr versetzt und gerade darum definitorische und diagnostische Kräfte auf den Plan ruft. So wurden einige Problemfelder identifiziert, die die Konjunktur dieser Vokabel antreiben und ihren polemischen Gehalt bis heute bestimmen. Lassen Sie mich ein paar dieser Elemente erinnern. So ruft der Populismus erstens immer noch eine Affektlage auf, in der die erratischen Wallungswerte von Wut, Ärger, Zorn ein mehr oder weniger artikuliertes Ausdrucksbedürfnis anzeigen und daran erinnern, auf welche Weise unausgeschöpfte Ressourcen an Unzufriedenheit oder rebellischen Regungen nach einer politischen Ausbeutung, nach Ausbeutungsarbeit verlangen. Mit dem Griff des Populismus wird eine Bereitschaft zu einem wie auch begründeten Unfrieden identifiziert. Zweitens hat er sich als ein Wiedergänger moderner Demokratien erwiesen, als Begleiter oder Schattenwurf dessen, was man liberale Demokratie oder Repräsentativsystem nennt. Im Populismus zeichnen sich prekäre Grenzen zwischen Stimmvolk und bloßen Geraune ab. Er umfasst plakative Programme der Inklusion und der Exklusion, er ist von sozialen Reinheitsgeboten durchzogen und fokussiert sich auf jene Verdikte, die deklarieren, was noch ein Volk oder schon keines mehr ist. Er verweist somit auf die Qualität von Repräsentationsweisen, die die Wege und Verfahren, auf die Wege und Verfahren, mit denen man politische Mitsprache reklamiert. Direkt oder indirekt, episodisch oder dauerhaft durch Parteien gefiltert oder plebiszitär exekutiert. Im Begriff des Populismus steht die Art und die Legitimität politischer Teilhabe auf dem Spiel. Drittens konnten sich unter dem Titel des Populismus all jene Gesten versammeln, die auf ominöse Weise im Dunkeln, auf, äh, auf ominöse Mächte im Dunkeln, auf verschworene Zirkel, da oben, draußen, in Brüssel, in der Presse, in Lobbys oder Lügenkartellen deuten. Auch diese Unterscheidungslinie wird mit dem Populismusbegriff aufgerufen. Ob Macht, formell, oder informell organisiert ist, ob Regierungsmacht sich in adressierbaren Instanzen oder Institutionen oder eher in diffusen Netzwerken und Commitments verkörpert. Die Rede vom Populismus schließt ein Problem politischer Formgebung ein. Schließlich und viertens kann vom Populismus nur dort die Rede sein, wo sich in öffentlichen Resonanzräumen der Vertrieb die Filterung oder Verstärkung dessen vollzieht, was sich selbstbewusst eigene Meinung nennt. In ihm ist demokratisches Kleingeld zur Sache politischer Kapitalbildung geworden. Populismus meint Meinungsherrschaft und somit die Frage, welche politischen Agenten mit welchen Verfahren und Konsequenzen das Recht auf diese oder jene Meinung wie hoch verzinsen. Wenn Pierre Savanon heute Abend über Demokratie und Populismus im 21. Jahrhundert sprechen wird, so geschieht dies in einem kritischen Augenblick, Sie wissen das alle, in dem darüber entschieden wird, ob oder wie sich gegenwärtige Demokratien in Dämonokratien verwandeln werden. Und er schlägt damit die Brücke zum Programm, das die Mosse Lectures dann auch im kommenden Wintersemester weiterverfolgen werden. Zur Diskussion jener neuen und epidemischen Herrschaftsform, in der sich auch in Europa der Abbau von Rechtsstaaten mit der Mobilisierung von nationalen oder völkischen Ressentiments verknüpft. Denn die Autokratien, um die es 
im nächsten Semester auch gehen wird, müssen als jene vielleicht bösartigste Option verstanden werden, die unter formal demokratischen Bedingungen die Kräfte eines Systemwechsels, die Kräfte der Gegendemokratie, wie Rosa Vallon selbst das nennt, versammelt. Was vor unseren Augen Kontur gewinnt, lässt sich mit erprobten Begriffen wie Totalitär oder Diktatur nicht fassen. Man muss es wohl eher als politische Katalyse demokratischer Erosionsprozesse begreifen, als einen Prozess, in dem sich informelle Regierungsmächte stabilisieren. Pierre Rosson Vallon hat in seinem jüngst übersetzten, aber schon vor längerer Zeit erschienenen Buch Die Gegendemokratie, Politik im Zeitalter des Misstrauens, einige Elemente dieser politischen Pathologie untersucht. Die Entstehung von Misstrauensgesellschaften, die Ablehnung des Repräsentationsprinzips, die Feindseligkeit als Programm der Vergemeinschaftung, Bestrafungsaktionen als vorzügliche Selbstbehauptung exekutiver Macht. Wie kein anderer wird uns Pierre Rosavallon, Professor für neuere und neueste Geschichte am Collège de France, Auskunft über dieses aktuelle Geschick demokratischer Systeme geben können, im Zeichen eben von Populismus, Autokratie, Gegendemokratie. In seinen mehr als 20 Büchern hat er die Geschichte, die Versprechen, die Theorie, die Realitäten, die Möglichkeiten, Krisen, Aussichten und Sackgassen demokratischer Politik untersucht und dabei deren Lebensmilieus und Sterbeszenen freigelegt. In Büchern wie Demokratische Legitimität, Gesellschaft dergleichen, die gute Regierung, die Gegendemokratie, um nur einige der ins Deutsche übersetzten Titel zu nennen, geht es immer wieder um die Spannung zwischen Freiheitsversprechen und Gleichheitspostulaten, um den Rückhalt oder die Erosion von Solidarmilieus, um die Stärkung oder Sklerotisierung demokratischer Entscheidungsprozesse, um den tödlichen Atomismus liberaler Wettbewerbsgesellschaften. Ich will nun den Überlegungen von Pierre Rosavallon nicht weiter vorgreifen, freue mich auf den kommenden Vortrag, hoffentlich zusammen mit Ihnen. Bitte begrüßen Sie Pierre Rosavallon. Please welcome Pierre Rosavallon. Thank you for inviting me at this very famous series of lectures. We have to take populism seriously. The term populism is everywhere today. It appears as central, but at the same time as problematic. We could first insist on the fact that it belongs to the large family of rubbery words used in the political sphere. When used critically, it is associated with a demagogic political style, one that is rejected instinctively and seen as a threat to liberty, founded as it is on a twisted conception of the democratic ideal. Conversely, for the increasing numbers of people who claim it with pride, populism describes a politics that is attentive to the interest of the many. They accuse their detractors of serving the interest of the rich and the powerful and of equating the people they seek to represent with the old and problematic populace. To speak of populism is, in the first place, to acknowledge the fact of this cacophony and the way in which insult and ideal are interwoven. This language problem is by no means unprecedented. For a long time, it was a problem that characterized the term democracy itself. It was at the same time, a promise in the future for some and a destabilizing problem for the others. 
The same holds true of reference to the people, the meaning of which long oscillated between the glorious idea of the civic body and the notion of a threatening crowd. There is nothing astonishing about such ambiguity. It can be seen as constitutive of the very nature of politics. One cannot simply acknowledge such opposition if one wants to understand a political phenomenon that we sense will dominate our century. Thus, one must abandon approaches emphasizing political style. After all, when it comes to flattering public opinion and making demagogic promises, no movement or party has a monopoly. One must also step, step back from the realm of suspicion, ruled as it is by fear, passion, and frustration that has formed by and take comfort in opposition. My perspective will be to take populism seriously and to understand it in terms of democracy's constitutive indeterminacies. Populism first presents itself from this perspective as a regenerative project of a democracy that is seen as atrophied, confiscated, and off course. Contrary to the totalitarian regime of the 20th century, which sought a substantive break with democratic forms that were deemed bourgeois due to their parliamentarism and pluralism, populism presents itself as a project for the restoration and procedural enrichment of an original democracy. To properly evaluate the scope of this project and the dangers it may entail, I propose to construct it as an ideal type, that is to consider it as a democratic form with its own consistency and coherence, a political form characterized by a specific rhetoric and referring to well-defined democratic ideal. Populism can only be understood and possibly criticized if one takes it seriously in this way. Seen in these terms, populism represents a specific understanding of three major aspects of the democratic ideal. Modalities of representation, condition for exercising sovereignty, and modes for establishing legitimacy and general will formation. The contemporary populist moment should be understood in such a broad vision. Considered in the immediate electoral dimension, populism obviously derived from a strong feeling of disenchantment. Part of the problem has clearly to do with the mistakes and shortcomings of traditional political parties who are often out of touch with society, concerned primarily with their own survival and even in some instances, corrupt. Populism also derives from a feeling of political helplessness. It's the reason why the European Union is very often accused on our continent to be the origin of the problem. But these charges do not explain everything. We have also to understand populism in a long-term history of democracy. History structured by social conflict regarding its definition, considered the long debates about universal suffrage, the persistence of undemocratic liberal regimes, and the arguments in favor of a theory of minimalist democracy. But history also structured by internal uncertainties. If it has seemed for two centuries now to be the unsurpassable principle of organization of any 
modern political order, the democratic imperative that spreads his assured belief has always been both ardently felt and be ambiguous in its implication. The dream of the good and the reality of indeterminacy have combined it over the long term. This coexistence is specific to the extent that it is due principally to the fact that democracy is not simply a distant ideal on whose content everyone already agrees, with debate only remaining for the means for realizing it. The history of democracy is, for this reason, not simply one of a blocked experiment or a betrayed utopia. Far from corresponding, then, to a simple practical uncertainty as to how to bring it about, democracy's unmoored meaning is due quite fundamentally to its essence. It implies a type of regime that resists any attempt at unequivocal classification. The train of disappointment and the perpetual feelings of his betrayal that have always accompanied it have turned just as much as the debate over his definition as resisted closure. One must begin with this fact in order to understand what democracy is, the history of a disenchantment of, and the history of an indeterminacy are bound up with one another. The indeterminacy is rooted in a complex network of equivocation and tensions that have structured political modernity since its, its inception, a study of the English, American, and French Revolution shows. There is equivocation, first of all, about the very subject of democracy, for the people do not exist except through approximate successive representation of itself. The people is a master at once imperious and impossible to find. We, the people, can take only debatable form. Its definition is at once a problem and a challenge. If the political principle of democracy, people's sovereignty, is universally accepted, its sociological qualifications appears problematic. There is an uncertainty next about the adequate form of social power. Popular sovereignty struggling to express itself through representative institution that will not lead to its limitation in one way or another. Hence, the ambiguity of the very notion of representative government, oscillating between the ideal of a technical substitute for a desirable but impossible direct democracy, and the idea of a prudential alternative to a dangerous direct democracy. The populist proposition is part of such a history of substantial uncertainties and social conflict. In a shorter term, populism also arises from two structural causes. First, a growing situation of uh, inequalities and social fragmentation on one end. And on the other end, the declining performance of uh, the declining democratic performance of elections. The first element in equalities is, of course, decisive. The rupture it implies with the previous 20th century, defined as a century of equality, is well documented, and I don't need to insist on it. But the second element is perhaps less described. The declining democratic performance of elections derives from the fact that elections have now a reduced capacity 
to fulfill their three essential democratic functions, representation, legitimation, and monitoring elected officials. In the first place, elections today are for sociological and institutional reasons less able to fulfill their representative function. The project of representing society was conceived, of course, as consisting in the creation of parliamentary assemblies at the beginning. They were imagined, as Mirabeau famously put it in 1789, as a picture of society on a smaller scale. The concept of representation was, in this sense, inseparable from the expression of diversity. From a sociological perspective, the concept of representation was implicitly underwritten by the notion that society was comprised of orders, corporate bodies, classes, and populations with well-defined characteristics, which led Rousseau to observe that there, was, that there was something medieval about the idea of representation. The concept is still meaningful, but society can no longer only be understood in these terms. We do indeed find ourselves in a new era of social identity, tied to the development of a society of individuals. The latter alters perceptions of society and the expectation of citizens. Its advent is a result of a growing complexity and heterogeneity of the social world. But at an even deeper level, it arises from the fact that individuals are henceforth determined as much by their own life stories as by their social conditions. In search of a society of individuals, misrepresentation is perceived more vaguely and more intensely at the same time, as it has an existential dimension. Hence, the success of the populist mantra, considering the people as a unifying denunciation for a diffuse feeling of absence of consideration, and the consequent temptation to substitute the perspective of incarnation to the former project of representing social classes. Election have, on the other hand, become less efficient at legitimating power, even if the primary and most basic characteristic of a democratic regime clearly remains the choice of the government by the governed. Yet, from the outset, this foundational accession harbored a major ambiguity. The general will was, practically speaking, equated with the majority. That a majority of vote established power's legitimacy was universally accepted as a very essence of democratic life. For the substance of his claim was never considered. In this way, a justifying principle and a selection technique became intertwined in democratic elections. On the other hand, elections deliver a governing license, but they don't define what a democratic government should be. The temporality of political life have, as a consequence, been transformed in various ways. First, the concept of platform, as in an uncertain world, lots its coherence. Platforms which used to be the centerpiece of election campaigns, revealing the major dividing line, dividing lines between parties, were expected to be put into practice after the election. They established in this way a relatively strong connection between the moment when election occurred and the moment when government acted. A new relationship to the future and the increasingly personal nature of political conflict altered the ability of elections to project their democratic effects into the future. Elections have, by the same token, been reduced to little more than nominating processes. In this way, the gap has increased between electoral moments and governing moments. 
Populisms denounce this distortion and they claim to offer a moral remedy to it by pretending to be the substantial expression of the interest of the real people, resolving consequently the defect of procedural democracy. Elections, thirdly, are no longer producing political will in a more globalized and interdependent world. Hence the populist proposition to restore the idea of sovereignty through an appeal to deglobalization. In this context, in false context, I would say, populism appears as a specific social and political proposition. To sketch out its characteristics, I will draw on the words of those who are described or who describe themselves as populist, as well as on those rare authors who have attempted to theorize populism. The latter are found notably among self-described left-wing populism. And as to Laclos and Chantal Mouffe are the major reference points of his trend. The creation and demands of left-wing populism, a new development we first appeared less than a decade ago, have moreover played a major role in broadening our understanding of a political culture that used to be confined for to the far right. The shift from the generic term far right parties to that of populist parties occurred in the early 21st century as the emergence of the Five Star Movement in Italy in 2009 made it necessary due to its specificity to re-evaluate existing political labels. If the word populism has now, <coughs> has now become mainstream, it remains vague. As a political rhetoric, populism rest on four main pillars. A conception as a presentation as incarnation, a celebration of direct democracy, a radical conception of the majoritarian view, and a specific sociological definition of the people. Representation as incarnation first. Populism bases itself on the conception of incarnation as the best form of representation. The leader is supposed to be the embodiment of the people. The specter of bad representation, characteristic of ordinary parliamentarism, can, in its way, be dismissed at the, at the same time as power's legitimacy is strengthened. It was in Latin America that this conception was theorized as early as the mid-19th century. I am not a man, I am the people. These words instantly repeated by Colombia's leader in the 30s and 40s, Jorge Eliezer Gaitan, set the tone for later populism across the continent. Gaitan was admired by Fidel Castro as well as Perón. More recently, in the 21st century, during his last presidential campaign in Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, while also explicitly referring very often to Gaitan, would repeat the magic words. When I see you, he would typically tell the crowd at his rallies, when you see me, something tells me, Chavez, you are the people. I am embodied in you. You are millions of Chavezes. Chavez's, Chavez is no longer just me. Chavez is the entire people. In his first inaugural address as president of the Republic in 1989, he went so far as to tell to the audience, I hardly exist. Get ready to govern. There could be no clearer way for legitimating a presidential regime that cling to the illusion that it is democratic. Direct sovereignty as second characteristic element. This conception of representation as incarnation is logically connected to conception 
of direct sovereignty in the form of election by acclamation. It is uh, very important to notice that uh, Chantal Mouffe and uh, Laclau, they, they quote very often from this point of view, Carl Schmitt. The people is supposed to exercise power directly through the mediation of its double, a concept that in its own way drew on the political theology of King's Two Bodies. This view was defended clearly by Ernesto Laclau, the thinker behind Kirchnerism in Argentina. Referenda are also, from his perspective, seen as an ultimate means of democratic expression. They are sanctified as the most indisputable form of popular sovereignty. The same can be said of the celebration of constituent assemblies by populist movement. The third characteristic is the majority, the vision of the majoritarian general will. While a political culture of unanimity underpins this conception of representation and sovereignty, it is nonetheless majorities that at the same time are seen in the populist vision as a way to express the general will. Populism is, on this, on this point of view, very traditional. But this conception is tied and irreserved to the claim of populist movements to bring together the real people when their opponents are accused of only representing minority group and foreign imperialistic or oligarchical interest. A simple majority can, in this sense, in this moral sense, express the entire people. Even as minorities, populist movement can make the same claim on the grounds that the real people has been blinded and fooled by a news media in the pocket of foreign interest. Populist movement reject, consequently, and this is a crucial point, of a form that express general will. I will return to this point. Notably, constitutional courts and independent authorities. This is a content that admits no exceptions. Witness the current situation in Europe with the Hungarian and Polish government and their relation with the constitutional courts. From a sociological point of view, the populist project seeks a kind of reconstruction of politics through a new understanding of society and its antagonisms. According to Laclau, populism, I quote it, populism is not an ideology, but a way of constructing the political that is based on dividing society in two and calling for the mobilization of foes at the bottom against foes at the top. Populism is first tied to a conception of society that is no longer based on social class. It acknowledges the fact that social cleavages are now multiple and cannot be reduced to class conflict. In this context, it seeks to connect various social demands by rearranging them according to what Laclau calls a logic of horizontal equivalence. That is, in terms of an opposition between the people united against elite, oligarchies, and established power. In the populist conception of the world, the people's unity is experienced at a practical level as a community based on rejection and separation, consistent with substantive conception of national identity. It is clear from this standpoint that identity can even become tied up with a racist and differentiating approach. This point, I must be stressed, is what very often distinguishes right-wing populism from left-wing populism, as the latter is rather characterized by a socioeconomic approach to identity that emphasizes redistribution. On uh, another hand, there is also a philosophy and economy of justice in populism that could be defined as national protectionism. Economic protectionism can consequently 
to such a sociological view be logically understood as an appropriate tool of identity-based equality. This is why populist movements in Europe have determinedly aligned themselves with the critic of the European Union. But protectionism is also understood in the populist view as a tool for reducing social fragmentation due to globalization and producing more equality through xenophobic and anti-immigrant policy. It's an old view which finds its origin at the moment of the first globalization. In the end of the 19th century, the notion of worker protectionism gained currency, expanding the original idea of tariff production. During this period, in France, Maurice Barres gained currency, uh, expanding the original idea of uh, what he called uh, national protectionism. And he published an uh, incendiary pamphlet entitled Contre les étrangers, against foreigners. The text, a uh, veritable political manifesto, was a synthesis of the main themes of xenophobic protectionism. Special tax uh, on employers using foreign workers, expulsion of foreigners, and so like. What was distinctive about national protectionism was that it represented an extreme case, the result of a radical polarization of both identity and equality. It's a theory of equality and not only of identity. It also simplified the social to the utmost and thereby reduced the idea of equality to the single dimension of community membership, which itself was reduced to a negative definition, not for it. It should be stressed that at about the same time, the invention of segregation in the United States rested on the same view. Whiteness was, at that time, considered as a central element of a racist vision based on a certain definition of equality. With such a definition of the constitutive element of populism, we could, uh, we could consider some question. The question of unity and diversity of populism. Are they, how to consider the differences between populism? If one can speak of an ideal type of populism, then it becomes possible also to distinguish different kinds of populism. While it is customary to speak in very general terms of left-wing populism or right-wing populism, we could uh, make different differentiation between populism with considering different, thing, different variables. First, the nature of the political cultures that can serve as populism basis. Thus, we could distinguish the tradition onto which populism is grafted. It can be joined to far-right tradition, as was the case in Europe at the end of the 20th century. In this context, populism was superimposed onto far-right concept. But populism can also be grafted onto political cultures that are Bonapartist or even socialist. There are also situational variables. Countries that benefit from rents, such as some Latin American countries, facilitated the emergence of left-wing populism with a capacity of uh, redistribution. And it is also necessary to make a very strong difference between populist movement and populist regimes. The former of the populist movement are characterized by the adoption of populist rhetoric, while the latter doubled down on this feature through authoritarianism and illiberalism, as in Erdogan Turski. The distinction between movements and regime helps us furthermore to understand how, in some cases, populist campaigns lead to oligarchical regimes, as in the case of Trump's. The slide toward authoritarianism, 
on the part of regimes that arise from this movement is justified by the radicalization between the real people and an opposition that is reduced of being nothing more than oligarchies or American imperialism in disguise. And also a critic of the press representing only special interests. This association justify bringing these groups into line as well as quashing of the media which stand accused of being merely the voice of minority interest and subversive project. The slide toward authoritarianism can also be achieved by submitting to majority approval constitution that in practice creates regime based on personal authority. When uh, a populist regime becomes authoritarian, there is always a proposition for a new constitution with new elements regarding the, the election of the, of the leader. At the same time, this definition of populism raises the question to know what's old and what's new in populism. If we consider the question of incarnation, already Napoleon saw himself as l'homme peuple and the people as a man, the expression itself was an expression used by uh, the partisan of Napoleon. Carl Schmitt, a century later, conceptualized also along similar lines the idea of election as an acclamation and the notion of the Führer as father of the nation. So there is nothing really new in the idea of incarnation. I mean, the temptation of incarnation is part of the history of democracy. At the same, on, on the other hand, the desire for direct democracy has been constantly proclaimed from the American progressive movement to the French Revolution. And the uh, uh, sacralization of the referendum is also a, an old story in democracies. So this aspect of populism is also part of the history of democracy. And the idea of uh, people united against oligarchies was too a crucial characteristic of nationalism, especially at the end of the 19th century in Europe. And one could also note that in the mid 20th century, it was in Latin America that uh, you had societies that were never organized along class societies that populism, populist regime were established. Once their place in a longer history of democracy and democratic disenchantment has been restored, it becomes apparent that there is nothing inherently new about contemporary populist movement. But they have, however, assumed an importance and centrality that is unprecedented. We could say that they are the polarized expression of problematic answers to democratic disenchantment. And they made a kind of a coherent political vision of all those kind of answers when it was scarce uh, answers before. We have also to mention the fact that there is today a global impact of the populist vision in the political and social fields. Populism has infiltrated the whole spectrum of ideologies. We could say that there is today an atmosphere of populism with the decline of traditionally organized political parties and the development of more informal political movement. A more important role also very often given to the procedure of referendum. Atmosphere of populism deriving also, it has to be mentioned, from the presidentialization of democracies due to growing centrality of executive power. In this context, how to criticize populism? The fact that populist movements frequently shift to authoritarianism 
means that they have naturally been accused of being illiberal. And most of the recent books on populism have been written along this line, criticizing populism as illiberal democracies. But this charge, in my view, is not enough. Worse, it is powerless if it is not accompanied by a genuinely democratic critic of populism. There is today a liberal critic of populism, but there is no democratic critic of populism, and in my view, that is a central point. What remains to be accomplished on this front is considerable. Even if one takes the sole example of a referendum and its uses, it is clear at present there exists no critical analysis of it as a genuinely democratic. One finds in populism an obviously democratic aura that must be systematically deconstructed. Elaborating a critic of his assumption is one of the decisive intellectual and political tasks of the moment. The first step in the right direction is to show that it is not by simplifying democracy, but on the contrary, by complicating and multiplying its modalities that one can overcome it, its incompleteness and move it forward. Because populism can be defined as an abstract, polarized, and simplifying approach to democracy. When he described the advent of the democratic world that he witnessed firsthand, Tocqueville observed the idea of government is becoming simpler with democracy. Number alone is right and lawful. All of politics is reduced to a question of arithmetic. Today, one must say exactly the opposite. Democratic progress means preserving democracy's complexity by multiplying the means through which the general will will express itself, by broadening the modalities of representation and by establishing pluralistic forms of sovereignty. The populist approach to representation is based on the perspective of identity between the leader and the people. It is a narrow and problematic vision. Representation should mean also making the social world present in public life. The quality of democracy depends on the permanent presence in political life of the lived experience of citizens and the recollection of their rights. Democracy does not only mean popular sovereignty, public deliberation, and the selection of representatives. It also means consideration for everyone, taking every condition explicitly into account. Consequently, this implies developing some forms of narrative representation alongside the more traditional idea of delegation representation, which incidentally works very poorly as a representative function of political parties as eroded as they have ingratiated themselves in the world of government. Indeed, not being represented means being invisible in the public sphere, not having one's problem considered and discussed. Representation has, in, its, in this instance, a cognitive and expressive dimension. A project of a narrative democracy means a complexification of representation, a way of building a society of individuals completely equal in dignity, recognition, and consideration who form a common society. Greater visibility and legibility make society more governable and reformable also. A society that falls short in representing itself in its complexity oscillate between passivity and fear. It tends to be ruled by resentment in which anger merges with powerlessness. Indeed, it must constantly caricature reality in the hope of making it malleable. 
In this way, society ends up being shaped by a phantasmagoric image of itself, designating scapegoat as a source of all evils. Democracy, however, can survive only if women and men recognize one another as they are in order to build a shared world. This means that it is necessary that some degree of mutual understanding exists between its members. For this reason, the price we pay for bad representation is as much social and moral as it is individual. We are terribly ignorant of one another. The historian Jules Michelet said when he explained the difficulty that individuals faced in forming a fraternal people with the onset of the new democratic republic in 1948. When reality is masked and when people's lives remain hidden, the imagination is governed by the effect of prejudice and fantasy. From this aspect, the alternative to populism is more narrative representation of the diversity of society. The implementation of such a narrative democracy depends less on institutional mechanism than on the polymorphous development of academic and activists seeking to tell society's story. And social sciences could play a major role in this uh, effort, but do so also literature, photography, and film. In the United States, during the Great Depression of the 30s, an effort along this line was made with the launching of the Federal Writers Project. I think we need this kind of project today to break with a vision, phantasmagoric vision of a united people and to build the real society of citizens. The new form of democratic legitimacy have also to be developed. Those new forms refer to approaches to democratic generality that mitigate the achievements of its traditional electoral and majoritarian expression by seeking to reconnect with an idea of the general will understood as society's unanimous expression. Two concepts can be used along this line to formulate from a different perspective the power of all that is the foundation of the democratic ideal. Those two concepts are the power of nobody and the power of anybody. The power of nobody emphasizes the principle of impartiality. It arcs back to a negative definition of the general will. An impartial institution is an institution that nobody, no interest group, no political party, no specific individual can claim to appropriate. The democratic power of everyone appears in this way as the power of nobody. Independent monitoring and regulatory authorities are based on these principles. Some were created by parliamentary assemblies to control and balance executive branches that are suspect of being partisan, others were launched by the executive branches themselves in order to restore their credibility. But their number today is on the rise, but they are not understood as democratic and not structured as democratic institution. We have to org democratically organize the power of those institutions. The power of anyone, on the other hand, refer to the fact that the people is not simply a population. It also consists of individuals, each of whom has rights that must be defended. It is in this sense that it is historical when it understands itself dynamically as a community founded on shared values. And how is this collective dimension to be described, if not in terms of the principles upon which it is based. To give the people as principle its proper political place means representing the people that can also be called legal in the terms 
of the constitutional language. This justifies the normative superiority of the constitutional order for not for liberal reason, but for democratic reason, for reason of legitimacy and representation. The function of constitutional courts is to represent these permanent people in which every individual counts because their rights are guaranteed. When the majoritarian orders often make decisions under the sway of events or in order to emphasize specific interests. The power of all are first, is first defined in the context as the power of anyone. That is, the power of every individual who has the right to have its right protected and the means to make good on them. It is along those lines that an enriched vision of legitimacy can be developed and not along the line of a simpler vision. A permanent democracy should also go beyond electoral democracy. Our regime may call themselves democratic, but we are not governed democratically. That is, it is a great split feeding contemporary disenchantment and disarray. Our regime are considered democratic in the sense that power arises from the ballot box after open competition and that we live instead based on the rule of law, which recognizes and protects or should protect individual freedom. These democracies are, of course, to a significant degree incomplete. The represented often feel abandoned by their legal representative and the people, once election are over, rarely feel sovereign. That's the definition of Rousseau. But this reality must not hide another fact, which has yet to be clearly identified in all its specificity. The bad government that afflicts our society at its core, why political life may be organized around institutions that constitute a particular type of regime it also consists in government action, that is the daily management of public affairs, a body that makes decisions and issues orders. It is a locus of the exercise of power, which in constitutional terms is known as executive power. It is with the latter that citizens deal with directly and on a daily basis. And the center of gravity of the democratic imperative has, in this way, quietly shifted. It is henceforth the relationship between the governed and those who govern that must be considered and uh, organized. For citizens, insufficient democracy means not being heard, decisions being made without consultation, ministers who fail to fulfill their responsibilities, leaders who lie with impunity, the corruption of cocoon and un uncartable political caste, and an opaque bureaucracy. The problem is that this aspect of democracy has never been considered as such. Democracy is always considered as a regime. It has rarely been viewed as a form of government, as it has also rarely been viewed as a form of society. Hence, the pressing need to enhance electoral democracy through permanent democracy. The purpose of the letter is to determine the qualities expected of governors and the positive rules organizing their relationship with the governed. Rules of transparency, responsiveness, accountability, evaluation of public policy, and so on. And fourth, what matters today is establishing such a democracy. It is because we lack such a democracy that the election of a chief executive can pave the way to an illiberal and evil a dictatorial regime. The modern world is full of examples of this kind, of which French Caesarism in the 19th century was the first instance. Nothing less than a second democratic revolution must occur along these lines. Such a revolution will usher us into an era of post-electoral democracy. I describe its broad direction and the way in some of my book, but the 
the work remains to be, to be done. We should never forget that today what makes the populism, populism flourishing is uh, democratic disenchantment and uh, social and economic uh, inequality. From the point of view of the institutional organization of democracy, we should stress the opposition between complication and simplification. Complication as opposed to simplification, this is the key issue upon which democracy's future hinges at a time when democracy seems fatigued. Its outcomes will depend in part of our ability to clarify its theoretical foundation. It is one of social sciences' major tasks at present. More than ever, democracy must define itself as the regime that is constantly questioning itself. It must remain a living and demanding experience rather than locked into a model in which the most, its most outspoken demands are lost. And the need of a new egalitarian ideology is also required to prevent the victory of populism. This is the reason why the analysis and the critic of populism can't only be based on a liberal analysis, but should uh, be considered as an element of uh, a consideration of an enlargement of uh, political definition of democracy and also of uh, uh, social definition of uh, uh, democracy. For this reason, I think uh, uh, we should have open discussion on populism from the point of view of the un achievement, an achievement of populist proposition in democratic terms. An achievement in terms of simplification, an achievement in terms of uh, uh, consideration, uh, uh, limited consideration between morality and, and uh, institution. And uh, these discussions do not really exist in my view today. And if we don't start this discussion and if we don't start the work permitting uh, uh, to, to found uh, this uh, discussion, the future of populism will be, alas, very uh, strong and uh, problematic. Thank you. Uh, uttered a very um, radical phrase or sentence uh, in your talk, um, uh, which was, I think, only uh, also a sentence in the book on good government. Uh, can you probably explain once more what you meant when you say very directly and very radically, we are not governed democratically? I mean that uh, democracy has been about the rules for establishing a legitimate power. So the history of democracy has been an history of organizing uh, the election on one end and on the other end, organizing uh, the institution, uh, permitting uh, the limitation of his elective power uh, in the time, for, uh, for instance. If you look at all the discussions concerning the core of democracy for two centuries, there have been discussions about uh, uh, the form of elections, discussions uh, about proportional representation, discussions about representation of social uh, of social movement, represent the, the, the terms limitation. Uh, all the discussion about democracy have been discussion about the rules organizing this establishing power through election. But they have not been 
uh, rules organizing uh, uh, the practice of, uh, of power. There are limits that are defined by the Constitution. But let's say the good practices of, uh, of power are not defined. When you consider, uh, for instance, uh, Aristotle, he said that uh, the, a good government is not only a legitimate government, it's a government defined by good practices. Good practices, and in those good practices, it also implied uh, the role of uh, uh, the political uh, words and the political discourse uh, uh, between uh, the citizens and, uh, and uh, the uh, organized uh, power. Uh, look at, at what uh, Michel Foucault said about uh, uh, the, le, le parler vrai. And uh, I think that uh, the only people to have considered uh, the real power was the uh, realistic theoretician of power. That is, people uh, trying to define the, the way you could uh, use the power to be protected from the citizens. But not trying to define uh, practices. And it's not only through institution that you make practices uh, uh, lively. It's also through uh, uh, the definition of good practices. <clears throat> May I, uh, I add uh, one more question to uh, what you said just in this moment? Um, so there's a difference between um, uh, democratic uh, elections, democratic legal structures, uh, and the more important question for you is how to be governed, uh, something which is called by uh, Michel Foucault, governmentality, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, to give us an example, uh, would it be for you, you are coming from trade unions, you worked in trade unions, you theoretically and practically uh, worked on uh, self-organization, self uh, autogestion uh, in, in, in French. Would it be just uh, this kind of uh, self-organization which um, can guarantee um, uh, this democratic uh, exercise of power or execution of power um, and is it linked for example to uh, 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 institutions or to organizations like trade unions? Is, uh, would this, is this an important impact? No, that's something different. You, you could say that organizations like trade unions, they, they, they have a role to play as institution uh, bargaining with, uh, with others. It's, a, a, it's an organization of representation of interest. Mm -hmm. and, and representation of interest means uh, bargaining in the economic sphere and also bargaining with the, with the government. But autogestion had also a meaning of redefining a democracy. Uh, when we use the term autogestion after 68, it was not only to define the, the way some small group were organized, it, has, it had also the vision to uh, redefine uh, democratic practices uh, with more implication of the citizens than only the election. And that, that was a project, globally speaking, of uh, participatory democracy. But I think that participatory democracy is a limited concept because participatory democracy in most of the cases was a redoubling uh, representative institution. It means you had, for instance, in a city, you have a legal representation, but group of citizens are organized in a different section of the, of the cities. So it's another way, it's, uh, um, I could say, an implementation, a development of the principle of representation. When today, uh, uh, you could say that what makes a citizen more responsible the citizen more active is when the citizen can be permanently <coughs> implied in something. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, Fichte had the idea that uh, democracy was defined by active and negative principle. Active principle, we could say that's election, that all the mechanism producing legitimacy. When negative democracy, uh, it's 
not only the eye of the, not only the voice of the people, but the eye of the people. Uh, ben Pham, at the beginning of the 19th century, said uh, we we, could, we should consider democracy as the organization of the voice of the people, but also democracy as the organization as the of the eye of the people. And uh, today, uh, uh, a permanent democracy is a democracy where the people has a permanent eye on the power. And for this role of uh, monitoring uh, elected uh, powers could be, of course, developed very precisely in terms of uh, evaluation of public policy, organizing responsiveness, uh, organizing uh, transparency. And uh, today, uh, take the example of the European Union today. If the European Union is considered by many citizens as undemocratic. Why? What is the answer? Is the answer to have a direct election of the, of the president of the commission? Is it to put more electoral uh, energy? Uh, no. To make uh, the European Union more democratic is to make the European Union less opaque is to make the uh, European Union uh, uh, obliged to, uh, to be accountable, is to make uh, uh, the Commission uh, more uh, transparent. And it is the same thing at the national uh, level. But I think Europe is a good example, but because we see clearly that it is not a more, more representative government at the European level that will produce a change in the relationship between citizens and the European institution. <clears throat> There's a central problem in Europe because we have executive powers in the EU which uh, transform to leg legislative powers. Um, uh, I think this is one of the main problems in the European Union. But um, let me come back to your um, uh, definition of um, or your concept of pop populism. Um, you have uh, four elements, uh, incarnation, direct sovereignty, um, um, the real people as majority, and finally society as an divided society. Um, I think important for your definition of populism is that you make no distinction between right and left in the beginning, um, but nevertheless uh, uh, you can have some difficulties uh, to focus on what is going on in Europe, which is right populism, and which is characterized by one element you didn't mention, the question of resentment, the politics of resentment. Um, uh, uh, where is uh, this movement, the movement of resentment, politics of resentment, uh, where does it take place in your uh, uh, reflection on, on populism? But it takes place uh, in what I call the fact of uh, democratic, dis democratic disenchantment. Uh, I just mentioned the expression democratic disenchantment, but if I want to analyze democratic disenchantment, of course. I have to, to, to speak of political emotions. I have to speak uh, of uh, resentment. I have to speak of elements that are not only institutional uh, elements, but I, I have not defined, in my talk, I have not defined uh, political de democratic disenchantment. But if I want to, to precise what democratic disenchantment is, I have, of course, to... to to put this kind of uh, elements in my uh, in my analysis. By the way, are there um, already some questions in public? If not, um, we are going on and are boring you. Uh, yes, please. Yes, uh, thank you for your talk. I have uh, only two uh, simple questions. The first one um, is uh, we tend to talk uh, about uh, right-wing and left-wing populism, uh, as you said, but what about um, populism in the so-called middle of the political spectrum? Maybe you could say a few words on this and yeah, we can think if, for example, Macron is a middle populist. <laughs> and the second question is, um, uh, what is the connection between neoliberalism 
and populism. Uh, because on the one hand, there are obvious uh, connections, for example, in Switzerland, the leading party, Swiss People's Party, is very neoliberal and uh, very right-wing populist at the same time. But on the other hand, um, sometimes uh, I think there are sorts of, the, of critique of neoliberalism that are uh, uh, very populist too, um, and remind me of um, assumptions of a dark conspiracy, etc. So maybe um, can we say populism is um, um, yeah a form of neoliberalism and anti-neoliberalism at the same time? Just to start with uh, your proposition to define a middle populism, but middle populism would be what I what I mentioned uh, with uh, the idea of atmospheres of populism, firstly, and secondly, and the fact that populism is not something new. Populism also, uh, there are elements, let's say, of populism permanent in the history of a democracy. What is new that are those elements now uh, are constituted as a system, but uh, the separated the element existed. And well, of course, there is a, if you use, uh, with Macron, you could say that as there is an element of Bonapartism in his vision. But Bonapartism, as I said, is, was also one first expression of a, a, a vision of incarnation, l'homme peuple. Uh, when, on the contrary, uh, a, a good Republican, it was the definition of Gambetta, Gambetta said, a good Republican shouldn't never consider individuals. And at the, in France, at the moment of the French Revolution, when the, uh, the king was killed, somebody said, we are now a republic, so we want to elect a president of the republic. And the answer was certainly not, because uh, uh, we shouldn't have a unique power, only collective uh, uh, power. So you see that uh, 10 years after, it was Napoleon. So you have the extreme collective power during the committees, with the committees. The committees were everything during the French Revolution, and on the other hand, uh, incarnation. That is, I think, that, that the central argument of my talk is that uh, uh, when you want to understand populism, you have to understand populism within the history of democracy. An element of populism has always been present because there is an undetermination uh, uh, in the very principle of uh, uh, democracy. That can be at the same time the power of nobody and the power of one, uh, uh, one leader uh, only. And middle populism, it's a fact that uh, uh, there is diffuse populism uh, uh, today. So we cannot say there is certainly elements of populist rhetoric that could be defined, I think, along the lines I try to, to use. But uh, uh, there are also many other expressions of movement and government that are partly, uh, and for some reason, populism. Consider Trump. Trump, in some way, is a populist, but is uh, really neoliberal when most most of the other populism in the world, or considered as populist, are against neoliberalism almost everywhere because they are against uh, uh, opening the, the economy for this very uh, simple uh, for this very simple reason. And uh, uh, it was the case also at the end of the 19th, at the end of the 19th century. You had the extreme left that was very close to uh, new nationalism. And Barres itself said that uh, uh, to become a nationalist was to redefine his socialism, uh, redefine his vision of, uh, of equality, for instance. Equality was no longer, to him, equality produced by social equality, but equality produced by uh, uh, identity. And you could say that in democracy, we, we had this tension between uh, identity and uh, social uh, equality. But we have, we have, we have really ident identity very present when 
social equality is, uh, is weak. That's very clear today. <coughs> But there is still, uh, is, uh, one moment please, uh, there is still uh, this one question of Florian Kappler uh, which is not answered. Uh, so once more the relationship between neoliberalism and uh, populism, a special kind of populism, because maybe there are two sorts of um, relationships. Uh, uh, there is a coalition between some kind of neoliberal politics and populism, for example in Germany, mm -hmm. and probably there is a genealogy of populism coming from neoliberal politics. And I think this uh, were the implications uh, of, your, uh, of your question. Mm. But I don't, uh, if, I, if I take example, I don't see many examples of, uh, uh, of neoliberal, neoliberal movements uh, defending at the same time uh, very strongly direct democracy uh, a vision of the leader as an uh, incarnation. Uh, I don't see many, many examples of, uh, of that. Uh, in, if, you, if you take the example of uh, the Tea Party in the US, is the Tea Party a populist party in, in the sense I, I define? Absolutely not. No, they, 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 have, no, they have no the social vision. They have no the... They, they have no the the vision of the leader as incarnation. There are, there are new kind of conservatism, but they, they are not uh, populist in, uh, in this sense. Uh, that is the reason why you should build an ideal type of populism. If not, uh, everything becomes populism. I think that uh, uh, you, the, the interest of building an ideal type is that you could uh, confront this ideal type to a reality. And so you can develop your ideal type or sub-develop your ideal type. But uh, uh, for instance, is Trump, is Trump a populist? Um, today, many, the word populist is used very often in uh, the sense of uh, critique of illiberalism. And I think uh, uh, what is illiberal uh, is populist. And I think that some populist regime become illiberal, but that, uh, uh, that is not the central, uh, the central point. Mm. But this is a very interesting um, uh, position. Uh, in your point of view, we in Germany don't have any populism. Mm. <laughs> okay, uh, good news for this evening. <laughs> no populism in Germany. <laughs> um, please, there was a question over there. You are extreme right that are not populist. Hmm? There are extreme right parties that are not populist. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I have two short questions. The first one is, which will be the next threat to democracy after populism, actually? Because there, were, there are political scientists and theorists that already in the 80s said that we should be actually scared by political masses without control rather than elites. Uh, so the, the threat to the institution would be not anymore at the top level, but from the bottom level. And one of them was uh, Giovanni Sartori, for example. The second, so which are the next threat after populism? Because something there will be in the future after this. And the second one is how we can actually distinguish people like uh, Orban that dismantle the entire institutional system from, uh, for example, populists uh, like Ciudadanos and Podemos in Spain uh, or. Uh, I don't know, but there are other populist parties like Five Star Movement in Italy did not directly uh, said they want to change the constitution or the institution of the state. So there is something that makes the difference between these people, between Orban, Duda, um, so Kaczynski in, uh, uh, in Poland and the other populists or not. Yeah, there the are reg political regimes and they are effectively characterized by the fact that they have no social policies, policies for more equalities. And their answer to social demands is nationalism. Uh, 
uh, uh, Russians are paid uh, in uh, nationalist money to compensate for uh, the absence of social uh, policy. And that is the case of Orban. That is the case of the brothers uh, Kaczynski. And they, they don't produce any kind of social reform, but they produce a, a, a sensation of uh, strength uh, as being a member of the nation. That, that is, from this point of view, it makes a difference between redistributive and you could say identity identity populism and redistributive populism, we could say. And in Latin America, almost everywhere, populism have started as redistributive. In, uh, in countries with rent, it was the case of, uh, of Venezuela, of course. Uh, it was the case of Argentina, uh, who are the, the fifth uh, uh, economy of the world uh, just at the moment of the First World War. Huh? We should uh, remember that. So it was immensely rich, and uh, Franco had, had a lot to, to spend. It's the same thing with the money of, uh, of uh, uh You say, well, what after populism? Uh, when you say some people said the, the danger is a masses, but a definition of democracy has always been under attack from this point of view saying democracy is dangerous. That was the reason why. The word democracy was not used at the moment of the French and American Revolution. At the moment of the French Revolution, you have 5,000 titles of newspapers. No one with the word democracy. And you know what? Because in the dictionary of the period, at the word democracy, you, you could read democracy a very old term of the antiquity, only survive in some Swiss mountain area. <laughs> so uh, it was considered as a, something old. In the US, on the contrary, democracy was an insult. Democracy was uh, the equivalent of populism today, exactly. It was the equivalent of demagoguery. And nobody used the term. Uh, uh, democracy. And if in the Jacksonian era in the US, uh, finally at the end, a democratic party uh, was organized, you know what? It is because the Jacksonian said, well, you permanently said uh, a poor Democrat, uh, it was an insult, but we are proud to be insulted. And we accept to be, uh, we accept your attack. We accept to recognize ourselves as democrats. It's the same thing with populism today. Some people say, you attack us being populist, but we are proud to be, uh, to be, uh, to be populist. But uh, the, what, what, what the next threat, this kind of threat, the masses, is part of the history of democracy. Uh, democracy, Platon uh, said democracy is dangerous because it's a power of masses. And in the Greek time, democracy most of the time was uh, uh, discussed from the point of view of the critics of democracy. There is not a single treatise on democracy in the Greek time, but there are a lot of critics of, uh, of democracy. And the critic, classical critic of democracy is the, is the power of, uh, of the plebs. Is a, pa is a passion against the reason, and that, that remains a permanent, a permanent debate. But a, a good, demo a, a real democrat, I would say, is somebody who accepts the, the problem of the passions in politics. We say that we, you can overcome passions with the power of uh, small groups, and you can't have. Uh, a good society if some people pretend to uh, arrange rationally uh, uh, what has to be uh, organized and not asking to the people. The question of passions is central to democracy and we must recognize passions as part of the experience of democracy. And you can't be a democrat if you don't accept the risk of demagoguery. Demagoguery is part of democratic life. That is a very important point. 
And the other point, what, what was the threat against democracy in, uh, in, the, in the 19th century? Uh, the threat was not democracy, it was undemocratic liberalism. Liberalism said, yes, undemocratic liberalism is a proper answer to the modern organization of politics. And in the 20th century, well, the, the great problem has been totalitarianism. But totalitarianism also can be defined uh, from the point of view of democracy. What some people like Claude Lefort and Anna Arendt also have uh, discussed is democracy as a pathology, as a totalitarianism, as a pathology of democracy. And I think that perhaps we could have in a different societies another kind of pathology, but all those pathology, it was the case with totalitarianism. Totalitarianism was also a pathology of representation, considering that the party was the, body, the embodiment of society. Party was the embodiment of society and of rationality. So it was a conception of, uh, of, uh, of representation. It was also a conception of participation, but participation not only through election, participation because uh, uh, people were involved in a social movement or involved in the, in the, in the party. You can, uh, all the four elements I have defined as uh, constituting uh, the base for analysis of uh, uh, populism, you could take them for analyzing totalitarianism, but with very uh, different answer, and so perhaps not other combination. <clears throat> Last question, please. <laughs> Monsieur le Professeur, uh, thank you for your talk. I have one question, if you don't mind. The one solution you proposed to populism was greater representation of diversity of the people. Populism, whether in Germany, in the UK, France, Italy, Denmark, or the Netherlands, wants to give less power in general, in general less power to the European Union arguing for greater representation of their people, German people, French people, etc. Do you see a problem on the, an intellectual problem on the liberal front with populism that hinders us to solve this problem because the solution proposed on the populism front, greater representation through diversity of the separate nations, is rejected because it's seen as illiberal. Does this conception hold us back? Yes, I, I am very surprised to all the books published uh, for the last year in the US on populism, they are very numerous. All of them are criticizing populism as illiberal. And uh, uh, they are not criticizing populism as uh, unachieved, as a, a poor definition of, uh, of democracy. And if you criticize populism only for defending traditional representative uh, uh, democracy, uh, it's a very poor definition because this traditional representative democracy is today uh, declining, is today uh, in a very poor, uh, in a very poor uh, condition. And uh, uh, the conditions into which is, uh, is considered uh, the problem of populism is, I think, very problematic, uh, very problematic uh, today. It's, if it is only the defense of um, liberal democracy, but uh, the question is that liberal democracy are really uh, unachieved and uh, uh, they don't produce enough uh, representation, they don't produce enough sovereignty, they don't produce uh, enough uh, legitimacy. And uh, uh, that is the reason why uh, you have this, pro this 
populist proposal. And uh, what we see now in Europe that uh, in, in 20 years ago, we only considered new uh, extreme right parties. And they were a form of populism, but we see that populism is, is larger uh, today. And uh, when the National Front, uh, Front started in France, they, they had Le Pen, uh, at, the, at the presidential election in the mid-60s, he had 0.3% of the vote. And uh, it's because step by step it become, it become something different. And uh, in the analysis, we, we should consider this problem very seriously. In Europe, this how to analyze the difference and the transition between classical extreme wing parties and uh, uh, populist parties. Why half of the workers are voting for uh, uh, the National Front, uh, Front in France. It was not the case at, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of, of Le Pen, uh, very clearly. So my, my talk is not uh, a talk with uh, decisive uh, analysis and proposition, but I try to give a direction uh, into which I think we should uh, uh, think uh, the analysis of the populism and the answers to uh, the proper answer to populism. Okay, the very last question. But please keep it short. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it would be a pleasure if you had spoken in French, but anyway, um, two short questions. Um, democracy uh, came up with the capitalism. Now, at the decline of capitalism, we can see also the decline of democracy into populism. Um, my question is, what will follow? Would it be a kind of ochlocratia, as Plato say, said? And the second is, we had tonight a very European-American point of view. Uh, what about China? What about India? What about the Arabic states? Thank you very much. Uh, for China, it's very simple. Uh, China says that uh, Western democracy is not a proper answer to a government for the people. Uh, as, you, as you know, there is a theory of the absence of election in a China. They said, well, there are, election, there are three ways of uh, choosing representative. There are elections. They could be chosen by election, by lot, or by exams. So lot is problematic. Election has proved to be poor. Uh, and exam is a good solution. And uh, exam is a good solution. And the, the Communist Party is the organizer of exams. And he said, who is entitled, uh, who is in capacity to, or not to, to govern? The, the books of a professor at Tsinghua Bell uh, has uh, theorized very clearly this point, uh, this point of view. And all the, the, the governors in China defend very clearly this position when, we, when you discuss uh, with uh, them. Concerning the first part of the question on, uh, on capitalism, for sure, if, uh, if the economic regimes of uh, our societies remain the present capitalism, uh, the future uh, is very dark. That, uh, that's, uh, that's clear. But uh, if capitalism is strong, uh, it's also because our vision of the alternative uh, uh, to capitalism or our vision of redefinition of social institution is, uh, is very weak. There is also uh, an intellectual uh, weakness, an intellectual blindness uh, in the present uh, situation. And I think it's one of the reasons why uh, there is a responsibility for social uh, scientists uh, today, and we should at the same time uh, 
of the point of view of the critic, but also at the point of view of uh, reimagining uh, democracy as well as the type of social solidarity and uh, the functioning of the economy also. Thank you so much, uh, especially for the pessimistic end. Uh, pessimistic end is a very good end, in especially of this uh, topic. Um, thank you so much also for your talk, um, for your answers. Uh, thank you to the public uh, for your questions, your patience, and for sacrificing this wonderful evening in the temple of theory, which is very important for us. Um, I, uh, uh, I say it in German, you... Um, <clears throat> yeah? I'm, Beg your pardon. Ich will noch mal darauf hinweisen, dass die Mosse Lectures fortgesetzt werden im nächsten Semester, eben mit dem Thema Autokratien. Das Thema wird uns praktisch und theoretisch hier drin und draußen weiter beschäftigen. Also vielleicht haben Sie Lust, auch da noch mal dabei zu sein. Ich wünsche Ihnen einen guten Abend und einen, 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 einen erfreulichen Sommer. Applaus